Starliner passes a critical test before its return, but we still have no date for that. NASA's next major telescope is surprisingly on budget and on schedule, and Falcon 9 finally returns to flight and does so with an impressive launch cadence. All that and more, this week in Spaceflight. This week, the U.S. Government Accountability Office released a report about NASA's Gateway Station that is definitely not great news for the program. Right off the bat, the name of the report is literally, NASA should document and communicate plans to address Gateway's mass risk. And if that's not a hint that the report isn't good, well, take a seat because it's about to get interesting. The report primarily focuses on the risks associated with what's called the initial capability of the Gateway Station. This consists of the Power and Propulsion Element, or the PPE, and the Habitation and Logistics Outpost, or HALO, which are the very first two modules of the Gateway Station. These will then be expanded with future modules such as IHAB and ESPRIT, which will turn it into what NASA calls the Sustained Configuration. However, Gateway is already having some major issues with just the first two modules. The report claims that NASA's cost baseline for this initial capability is $5.3 billion, and that's scheduled for December 2027. The problem is that both PPE and HALO were initially supposed to cost about five times less than that and launch a lot earlier in the decade. The report highlights several issues that have led to this. For example, very early on, NASA changed its plans on how to launch these two modules, which were initially supposed to be launched separately. Instead, the agency decided to develop and build both modules separately, and then join them together on the ground, then launch on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket. Now back then, NASA thought that this would reduce the number of launches and dockings needed to build up the initial capability, and would allow them to launch crews to Gateway a lot sooner. This has, however, proven to be a lot harder than initially thought. The modules have already incurred delays throughout their own separate development timelines. For PPE, for example, one delay occurred during the development of the ion thrusters that will be used to maneuver Gateway. These thrusters are some of the most powerful ion thrusters currently in development, and some of the first to be used on a human-rated vehicle. NASA has been struggling to fully develop them on time. On top of this, the addition of HALO to the launch also meant changing its design late into development. The new design added more propellant and an extra ion thruster to move the combined stack from a high Earth orbit to its final near-rectilinear halo orbit around the Moon. Furthermore, both modules are also well over the mass that had been allocated for them in order to launch on Falcon Heavy, and this is precisely where the name of the report comes from. The report says the combined stack is about 1,312 kilograms over the allocated mass. Most of the extra mass turned out to be due to miscalculations and underestimations on what the actual mass of these vehicles would end up being. If these mass issues aren't resolved, Falcon Heavy won't be able to put these two modules into the required insertion orbit. Not to mention, PPE will take more time and more propellant to move into orbit around the moon. And those are just issues that are already affecting the mission. The report also identified a number of other issues that would impact future operations. For example, the IHAB module set to launch on Artemis 4 is also already over its allocated mass. NASA's plan for reducing weight on HALO's launch was to just fly some of its components on SpaceX's Dragon XL cargo spacecraft. But if IHAB also needs to reduce its mass, NASA might not be able to fly that extra mass on Dragon XL 2, and at the end of the day, that spacecraft is supposed to be a cargo vehicle carrying supplies and things like that, remember? Add to that the fact that Gateway may not be able to control its attitude while the Starship human landing system is docked to the station because of its ridiculously larger mass. And this is just the tip of the iceberg of all of the problems that the report identifies. It even went so far as finding out what NASA is going to be doing with Gateway other than being some sort of hub to dock things in lunar orbit. Apparently, under NASA's current planning, it doesn't seem like the agency has many plans beyond supporting lunar missions. Its original goal was to also support missions to Mars, but the way things are shaping up, those missions may be right at the end of Gateway's expected 15-year lifetime. So seeing all of this, we hate to say it, but is NASA's Gateway doomed? Tune into our Flame Trent show later today for some spicy debates about this and a whole lot more. Last week, we featured a Starliner story, and of course, this week, there are even more developments. Now, first off, in case you missed it, you really should just go back and watch the whole thing because we went into all of the stuff that NASA planned for this week and all the testing that needed to happen. 
Now, if you did watch it, then you won't be surprised to know that NASA and Boeing performed a series of thruster tests back on July 27th while Starliner remained docked to the ISS. The test involved firing 27 of the spacecraft's 28 thrusters on the service module, one at a time, checking for anything out of the ordinary. Boeing says that the preliminary results of this test appear to have been positive, with all tested thrusters showing thrust levels similar to those prior to launch. As part of this test, teams also tested for helium leaks, opening the helium manifolds that pressurize the propellant system and gathering data needed to further characterize this issue. These manifolds were only open for the test, so right now there's no further leakage. NASA says that preliminary analysis shows that there's still margin needed to support a return trip from the station. But just like last week, that return still has no date in sight. NASA and Boeing were supposed to undergo a return readiness review after the hot firing tests, culminating in the team setting a return date for the spacecraft. However, based on a recent update from NASA, it appears that such a review did not happen, and in fact teams may need more time. The update Update literally says, quote, teams are taking their time to analyze the results of recent docked hot fire testing, finalize flight rationale for the spacecraft's integrated propulsion system, and confirm system reliability ahead of Starliner's return to Earth from the International Space Station. But of course, with more time comes even more doubt as to what's going to happen with Starliner. So we're just going to have to wait and see when that return will happen. NASA says planning for this return is set to continue into next week and that more information will be shared then. Will we know Starliner's return date for our next episode of This Week in Space Flight? And now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. Stoke Space surprised us this week with an interesting update about its Nova rocket. The company posted a picture on social media showing multiple barrel sections and a tank dome being manufactured at the company's factory. What's even more surprising is what the post said about them. They are apparently flight hardware. Stoke is aiming to perform up to two flights of its Nova rocket next year, so it kind of makes sense that the company is going full steel ahead with the rocket's manufacturing. We also saw in recent weeks the first firing of the engine slated to be used on the first stage, and just a year ago the company flew a subscale version of its reusable upper stage. So when you put it all together, it's starting to look real. We may actually see this rocket fly in the next year or so. Another company closing in on its rocket debut is Rocket Factory Augsburg, which just completed acceptance testing of the second stage of its RFA-1 rocket. The company says this second stage is now headed to Saxevoord, where RFA already tested the first stage of this rocket a few weeks ago. The company has not yet disclosed what steps it'll follow before the debut flight of RFA-1, but given that the first stage has yet to complete a static fire test with all of its engines, we can guess that's probably one of the upcoming tests. RFA is also in the process of building the umbilical tower for the second stage at the launch site, so once the second stage arrives and is integrated with the first stage, the teams will be able to test all of the new hardware well ahead of flight. And going on to more rocket hardware, Relativity says it's currently upgrading its testing facilities at Stennis. The company is currently installing the flame diverter for a second Eon-R test bay that will allow teams to increase the engine's testing cadence. This engine fired up for the first time last year in the adjacent test stand and has gone through several test firings since. Since then, Relativity has been able to upgrade this engine with multiple block upgrades that have simplified manufacturing and enhanced its reliability. But in the future, there will have to be a stand to test all 13 engines while attached to Terran R boosters. That'll be at the A2 stand at Stennis, and Relativity says it's now preparing the foundations where the propellant tank farm for this stand will be located. It's so very exciting when we get to see lots of rocket and test hardware getting ready for action. This week, NASA's Office of Inspector General released an audit of the agency's Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. This telescope is NASA's next flagship telescope with a cost of $4.3 billion. Roman will have a resolution comparable to Hubble, but it'll be able to observe an area of the sky that is substantially larger. Imagine something like the Hubble Deep Field, but instead of being just a teeny tiny little piece of the sky, it's about two thirds of the entire thing. Roman has an incredible set of high resolution infrared sensors and an array of state of the art instruments in order to perform its observations. So of course, with all of that technology and power and whatnot, it is quite impressive that this audit says that the program remains on schedule and on budget. 
Now this didn't come out of the blue. Early on in the program's life cycle, NASA re-baselined it to account for potential delays and cost overruns as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The audit also talks about how complicated it'll be to handle the huge amounts of data that'll be coming from Roman. And let's not forget, the mission is set to launch by May 2027, so there's still a few years that the program could still run into issues, but well, hopefully that doesn't happen. While SpaceX prepares for its next crew rotation mission to the International Space Station, the company is already gearing up for the next one after it, Crew 10. This week, NASA announced the crew that will be flying on that mission, which is slated to launch in February of next year. NASA astronauts Anne McLean and Nicole Ayers will be Crew Dragon's commander and pilot for this mission, the first time a spacecraft has a female commander and a female pilot. Alongside McLean and Ayers will be JAXA astronaut Takuya Onishi and Roscosmos cosmonaut Kirill Peskov, who will be mission specialists. All four crew members will be flying on a new Crew Dragon capsule for this mission, which means they'll get to choose the name of that spacecraft. Crew 10 will be the first flight into space for Ayers and Peskov, and the second for McLean and Onishi. In fact, Anne McLean's first flight made her the first person to enter a Crew Dragon while in space during SpaceX's Demo-1 mission back in March of 2019. Quite a neat coincidence that she's now going to be a Crew Dragon commander. On more SpaceX Dragon news, this week the company announced that it's moving Dragon recovery operations to the U.S. West Coast. In its update, the company cited finding pieces of dragon trunks in populated areas as one of the reasons that prompted them to make this move. Under current operations, Dragon's trunk is jettisoned before the deorbit burn happens, which means its reentry location is at the mercy of orbital mechanics and atmospheric drag and cannot be controlled. SpaceX had apparently studied ways to perhaps change this by modifying the trunk's design, but ultimately decided to just keep the trunk through deorbit burn and jettison it after that. However, if they were to do that while still retaining a return to Florida, then the trunk would eventually fall over populated areas. The vast areas of water in the Pacific Ocean are thus better suited to not throw chunks of dragon trunk all over people when returning dragons. This move, however, won't be immediate. SpaceX says it doesn't plan to make the move until next year and that it still needs to finalize planning and approvals and that its recovery vessels would also need to move over to California to support this. Now let's take a look at all the space traffic this week and see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. This week, we finally had the return to flight of Falcon 9 after it suffered a launch failure during the Starlink Group 9-3 mission earlier in July. This return to flight took place on July 27th at 5.45 UTC from Launch Complex 39A in Florida. The mission carried none other than 23 more Starlink satellites into low Earth orbit. This launch took place just 15 days, 3 hours, and 10 minutes after the previous mission, making it one of the fastest returns to flight in history and certainly the fastest of the last few decades. It was also faster than Falcon 9's two previous returns to flight, which lasted 176 days for CRS-7 and 153 days for Amos-6. Thankfully, no issues happened during the mission, and Falcon 9's streak of successful flights has begun once again. The first stage for this mission, B-1069, was flying for a 17th time, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions. This was also the first time SpaceX used a new vessel named Go Cosmos in order to recover the fairing halves for the mission. SpaceX's vice president of launch said on social media that Go Cosmos is currently replacing Doug, one of SpaceX's multi-purpose recovery vessels in Florida, while it undergoes maintenance. Once Doug gets back into action, Bob will head out for maintenance as well and Go Cosmos will take over its duties in the meantime. As is typical for SpaceX, the company wasted no time and launched again almost 24 hours after that return to flight. That liftoff took place on July 28th at 5.09 UTC from neighboring Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The mission was also carrying another 23 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The booster supporting this mission, B-1077, was flying for a 14th time and it successfully landed on a short fall of Gravitas. But wait, there's more! Just a few hours later that day, at 9.22 UTC, SpaceX launched yet another Falcon 9, this time from Vandenberg. The mission was carrying, yep, you guessed it, more Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit. This one, however, also had 13 Starlink direct-to-cell satellites on board. This means that SpaceX not only returned Falcon 9 to flight, but also performed three missions in less than 28 hours. While not a record for SpaceX, the record for three consecutive missions is actually closer to 20 hours, it definitely is quite a flex to not just come back, but to come back with this sort of cadence. 
And as usual for Falcon 9, the booster for this mission, B-1071, successfully completed its 17th launch and landing, touching down on Of Course I Still Love You a little over 8 minutes after liftoff. Wrapping up the month of July, we had another launch, but this time by ULA with the venerable mighty Atlas V rocket. Liftoff from the company's launch pad at Space Launch Complex 41 took place on July 30th at 10.45 UTC, just a few minutes after sunrise. The mission, called USSF-51, was a classified mission for the US Space Force carrying an undisclosed number of payloads into a geosynchronous orbit. Post-launch tracking data shows at least three objects that have been identified from this launch, but, well, let's say it wouldn't be the first time we eventually discover more objects being deployed in orbit. Atlas V was flying in the 551 configuration, which means it carried a 5 meter diameter fairing, 5 solid rocket motors on the first stage, and a single RL-10 engine on the Centaur upper stage. The 5 meter fairing was also the short version, so whatever was being flown on this mission probably wasn't a very bulky object like one of the big military satellites. This was ULA's 100th national security mission and the 58th and final national security mission flown by Atlas V. Going forward, all national security missions performed by ULA will be flown on the Vulcan Centaur rocket. In fact, the USS F-51 mission was supposed to fly on Vulcan, but was moved to the Atlas V because Vulcan was behind schedule. This, however, is not the final flight of Atlas V. The rocket still has another 15 missions on its schedule, eight of them in support of Amazon's Kuiper constellation, six of them for Starliner's operational missions to the ISS, and the other remaining mission for the launch of Viasat's second Viasat-3 satellite. That Atlas V launch concludes all the launches that have happened in July, which ends at only 13. This is, of course, due to Falcon 9's grounding, which only allowed SpaceX to fly six times in July, compared to the usual 10 to 14 times. Despite this, the US still leads the worldwide rank with 86 launches. China was also not very active this month, with just three launches in July, but we did get to see the debut flight of Ariane 6. And moving into the month of August, we had the launch of a Chongzheng 3BE from China. Liftoff took place on August 1st at 1314 UTC from Launch Complex 2 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center. The rocket was carrying China's second WHG satellite into a geosynchronous orbit. This satellite, called Weixing Hulianwang Gaogui, which roughly translates into Satellite Internet High Orbit Satellite, is suspected to be an experimental high-throughput communications satellite to be located in an inclined orbit at geosynchronous altitude. And of course, with Falcon 9 back in action, there was yet another Starlink launch to wrap up the week. The mission, Starlink Group 106, lifted off just this morning from Launch Complex 39A, carrying another 23 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The mission comes just about six days after the previous launch from LC-39A, breaking that pad's turnaround record by about a day. The first stage, B-1078, was flying for a twelfth time on this mission, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas. Going into next week, we should be hours away from Electron's next launch from New Zealand. This mission was delayed from last week due to bad weather, but has now been rescheduled for August 2nd. The opening of the two-hour window is set to take place at 1615 UTC. SpaceX and Northrop Grumman are teaming up again this weekend to carry another Cygnus cargo spacecraft to the International Space Station. Falcon 9 is set to lift off on August 3rd at 1528 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 with the SS Francis Dick Scobie Cygnus spacecraft. The weather forecast currently shows only a 50% chance of favorable conditions due to an oncoming tropical storm in Florida, so don't be surprised if this mission ends up delaying a few days. But if the mission does indeed lift off this weekend, Cygnus is set to be captured by the ISS robotic arm on August 5th at 7.55 UTC. Just a day after Cygnus, another Falcon 9 is set to launch from Vandenberg, and this one will be the first mission of another Starlink group. The mission, called Starlink Group 11-1, is set to take place within a four-hour launch window that opens on August 4th at 7 o'clock UTC. And nope, we have no idea what's new for Group 11, but it'll give us a lot to talk about, that's for sure. From the other side of the world, a Chongzheng 6A is set to launch from Taiyuan, carrying a yet unknown payload. Liftoff for this mission is expected to take place at around 7 o'clock UTC. And to end the week, we'll have another Falcon 9 from Florida carrying another batch of Starlink satellites. This one is kind of dependent on whether the Cygnus mission flies on time or not. If it does, liftoff would take place within a four-hour window opening on August 8th at 12.36 UTC. 
And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, and I'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.